Welcome to our services again at the Springdale Free Will Baptist Church. Today is Sunday, August the 22nd, and this morning we're going to take a look at the first part of Revelation chapter 7. My message is titled very simply, The 144,000. A lot of people spend time trying to figure out who the 144,000 are. And I hope that this message this morning will help you as we study what God's Word has to say. If you're in Revelation chapter 7, please follow along as I begin to read, starting with the first verse, and I'll continue down through verse number 8. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephilim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as again we come to the study of Scripture here in our services today, I pray, Lord, that you will speak to us clearly Open up our minds and hearts of understanding that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Help us, Lord, to be good students of the word of God. Lord, I believe that this book is your word. I believe it is infallible. I believe it is inerrant. I believe it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that holy men of old, they wrote these things down and spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God and that we have a sure testimony here in our old King James Bibles. Lord, I pray that as you speak to our hearts, help those who are discouraged to become encouraged. Help all of us to realize that you are still in control. And though the circumstances in our country and even around the world seem very, very difficult, there still are those fighting for their lives because of this virus. Others who are trying to stay alive, fighting against the violence and the murder and uh, the evil intents of others. Those who are fighting to overcome drug addictions and, and with the increase of fentanyl in our country, so many people are losing that battle. But Lord, most important of all is that we win the battle of eternal life, not because we're fighting it, but because you give it as a free gift to whosoever will. Lord, you only tell us that we must repent of our sin. We must believe by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the only way to have life eternal. As we study about these 144,000, Lord, again, I ask that you would speak to us. Please speak through me. Forgive me of my sins and my shortcomings. Help me as I stand behind this sacred pulpit, dear Lord, to do that which you've called me to do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Some people are discouraged from studying the book of Revelation. 
they have realized that there are parts in the book of Revelation that are not chronological, and that can be somewhat confusing. Also, many things in this book are symbolic or figurative, and so some folks avoid studying this wonderful book because they think that they can't understand it. Well, I'm here to preach again this morning that, yes, we can understand it. If God didn't want us to know about these future events, he would not have included the book of Revelation in the Bible. But even more so, I showed us in the first couple messages that I had back in January that God promises a blessing to everyone that hears the words of this book, who reads the words of this book, and who keeps in their heart and in their life the sayings of the prophecy of this book. God wants us to read it and to study it and to receive his blessing from this wonderful book. Now before I get into the topic of my message, I want to sort of take a little sidetrack if you will allow me. Debbie, my wife and I have been married for 48 years and I love her dearly. There are times though when my wife is trying to tell me something or perhaps me and, and my family. And at times, she happens to leave out some of the important details. And we get a little confused because she might be talking about one thing and then suddenly start to talk about someone else or something else without giving us any warning. And here we are, our minds are trying to put together what she's saying. And in her mind, she believes she has said some of the words that were missing from what we heard. And it's not just me. You can ask my sons. They're here in, in, uh, in our service today. They'll verify it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not complaining. Uh, either I or they have to ask for some clarification. And I often tell her I can't read her mind. You can laugh if you want. To. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> 48 years together plus nearly three years that we dated. There's still some things I can't figure out. And, and like I said, bless her heart. I love her. I really do. And uh, the Lord's blessed us with a wonderful family, wonderful church family, wonderful friends, uh, 10, 11, excuse me, grandchildren, and uh, God's good. And in just a couple of weeks, less than two weeks, one of my boys will be married. And we're looking forward to that and, and their wonderful relationship. Well, the reason I said that about wanting some extra details is because a lot of times we want some details from the Lord. And it's not that he forgets to give them to us. It's just that God chooses to only reveal certain things to us. Sometimes the Lord uh, is, is explaining things in the Word of God, and it's sort of like in school, I want to raise up my hand and say, well, Lord, can you explain this a little bit more? Lord, I want to know about that. And the Lord just kind of reminds me from time to time, you don't need to know that. And if I want to tell you someday, I will. But right now, you don't need to know. You just need to believe what I'm telling you. Don't you sometimes feel that way when you're talking with the Lord? He'll give us what we need. He doesn't always give us what we want. So remember that we are studying the book of Revelation, or as it's called in the Greek language, the Apocalypse. Both of those words mean the unveiling or revealing. Think about the name of this book, Revelation, revealing. It's like God's pulling back the curtain or pulling off the cover to show us what he has for us in this wonderful book. And in fact, as we've studied in previous lessons, that God has told John to write down the things which must be to show his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. So the things that are in Revelation are to help you and I understand the things that are going to happen to us. Have you ever been telling someone about what happened and then you decide you need to stop to explain some other details and then get back to your story? Whoops. <laughs> I've done that. You know, you may be talking about someone and, and maybe the other person doesn't know exactly who you're talking about. So you stop in the middle of your story and say, well, you know, they were married to so-and-so or so-and-so was their, their father, whatever. You give a little more explanations. And, yeah, they used to live here, but they moved off to another wherever, you know, so many years ago. 
we sometimes will pause to give a little bit more details and more explanation. Well, that's exactly what God is doing here in Revelation chapter 7. God is providing us with some of those extra details that we wouldn't otherwise have known. I would just say, thank you, Lord, right? He's giving us information that is not part of the chronology of the events in Revelation, but these are important things that he wants us to know. Let's recall that back in chapter number 6, Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, had that book with seven seals, seven bands, or seven uh, uh, things wrapped around it to keep it from being opened. And John in chapter number 5 was weeping because nobody in heaven or under heaven or under the earth was found worthy to open the book, to break those seals. And then one of the elders said, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has prevailed to open the book. So in chapter 6, we watched as Jesus broke open six of those seven seals. Do you remember the first seal? There was a rider on a white horse. And that, I believe, represents the Antichrist. Then there was a rider on the red horse. That represents war and bloodshed. Then there was a rider on the black horse, which represented famine. And then the pale horse rider represented death, and it said hell followed him. These are things that happen near the beginning of that tribulation period, that seven-year period of time. So in chapter 6, we saw all the way through the sixth seal. When he opened seal number 5, we saw, uh, John saw under the altar where the souls of those who were killed, who were martyred for their testimony of the word of God. Seal number 6, I preached about last Sunday, which included a lot of signs in nature, things like the, the shaking of the earth, the great earthquakes and, and uh, terrible storms and rocks and mountains moved out of their places. And people, whether they were rich or poor and anywhere in between, those people were praying to the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. But in chapter number 7, it's sort of like Jesus hits the pause button. You know, if you have some uh, device there at home, maybe you watch TV or watch a recording, we've got a pause button that we can kind of put that on hold for something else. So in a sense, Jesus is pausing or changing the channel, so to speak, to give us some important information. What I would call chapter 7, then, is a parenthetical chapter. It's a parenthesis. You know, when you're reading something, sometimes there will be these parentheses and there's extra information given in there before the rest of the story goes on. This isn't the only parenthetical passage in the book of Revelation. There are several more, and we'll run across them as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study. So John sees and hears what will happen in the future, and Jesus sort of pauses that long enough for him to get an explanation here in chapter number 7. So let's look uh, again, at verse number one, this passage is showing us that the Lord is still in control and that he has a believing remnant there in Israel at this tribulation time. Verse one, and after these things, the things that I just talked about, the things that we saw in chapter six, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any, on any tree. The four corners of the earth do not mean that the earth is square. Or like some people claim that the earth is flat. There are still people today who believe that the earth is flat. They're part of that lunatic fringe. You know, um, some people aren't even sure if we're really here. Maybe we're just imagining that we're here that we exist. Well, I'm not going to worry about them. Uh, hopefully they'll turn to the Lord and get their, their mind and heart and life straightened out. But it really is talking here about the four points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. Remember, these are four angels, and they have control over the winds at these four corners or four points of the compass on the earth. 
The reason I say that, that these would be points on the compass is, in, for example, in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 4, mentions a north wind and also a south wind. In Exodus 10 and 14, Job 38 and Psalm 48, they all mention about an east wind. And then in Jeremiah 49 and 51, we find that the wind is a symbol of divine judgment. So these four angels are in control of the winds of the earth, north, south, east, and west. And we're going to see as we study on that this other angel appears telling them, hold those winds back. I've got something important that I need to do. Before I go on, though, let's talk just a little bit about angels. Angels play an important part of the book of Revelation. In chapter 5, there's a mention of a strong angel. Here in chapter 7, there are four angels holding the winds, and then we're going to study about another angel who appears from the east. In chapter number 8, there's an angel at the altar in heaven. There are also seven trumpet angels in chapters 8 through 11. In chapter number 10, there is a mighty angel with a little book. In chapter 16, there are seven vile angels, seven angels that hold the seven vials of extreme judgment. And then there's another angel at the altar. In chapter 18, there's the angel of great power. And then it mentions a few verses later about another mighty angel. In chapter 19, there is an angel in the sun. So that's just a sampling of the many angels that we find in this book. So God has these four angels pause the wind because, look at verse number 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Why does God tell the angels to hold back the winds? It's so they can seal the servants of God in their foreheads. That seal would be one of great protection. Now, when the Bible does talk about angels, sometimes it refers to angels as stars. We see this in the book of Job, for example. So many Bible-believing scholars believe that the angel who's ascending from the east is actually the Lord Jesus, who is called the bright and morning star. In the scripture, his second coming is referred to as lightning, which shines from the east to the west. In Malachi 4, it refers to Christ as the sun of righteousness that shall arise while the sun rises in the east. Ezekiel 43 says, he is to come from the way of the east. And by the way, one other thing. You remember the star of Bethlehem? The star that appeared to show the birth of Christ? There was a star in the east. That's what the wise men said. We have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So it would seem that probably it's Christ himself who is the superintendent in charge of sealing these 144,000 and that he is referred to as the angel out of the east. Well, let's go on. Verse number 4, and I'll read down through verse 8 as I read earlier in the message. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. I've already read through this list, so I won't read through it again, but we find that there are 12,000 sealed from each of the 12 tribes. I also want to point out this. There are no lost tribes of Israel. People have talked about that for hundreds of years of time. That, you know, the Israel was carried off captive on several different occasions. The Assyrians in about 722 or 721 B.C. carried many Jews off and dispersed them throughout the known world. And then in 586 B.C., we find the Babylonians carried off the southern two tribes of uh, Benjamin and, and Judah. And eventually, those were allowed to return back to the land. But scholars say, well, we don't know what happened to the ten tribes from the northern kingdom. They're lost. Some people falsely claim that 
uh, the British Empire, including the United States of America, that we are the ten lost tribes of Israel. I don't believe that. <laughs> but that's what some people claim. Some people claim that the church has taken the place of Israel in God's program and plan. But I say there are no lost tribes of Israel because God knows exactly where they're at and who they are. He is the one in charge of sealing these 144,000. There is a slight difference in the list of the 12 tribes from some of the lists that we've seen in the Old Testament. For example, the tribe of Levi replaces Dan in the list, and Joseph replaces his son Ephraim. We don't know exactly why those two tribes were replaced, except that maybe it was because it was those two tribes of Dan and Ephraim who, under the rule of Jeroboam I, they had set up these golden calf idols in Bethel and in Dan to worship. Uh, that was after Solomon died, and at the time the kingdom had split up. It, the kingdom was divided. So it could be that God left them off the list because of their idolatry. We don't know for sure. But still I would wonder, and I would ask, and you probably wonder too, who are the 144,000? Well, to explain that answer, I want to start off with who they are not. Sometimes it's helpful when we're trying to understand something to figure out what it's not so that we can better understand what it is. I would say, first of all, they are not Jehovah Witnesses. The Jehovah Witnesses is a cult. And they claim that they are the 144,000. That of the Jehovah Witnesses, that there are 144,000 overcomers who remain faithful to the end. That's not true. That's not in the Bible. Also, there are Seventh-day Adventists. These are uh, people that worship on the Sabbath day and believe that we should keep some of the Old Testament law. So the Seventh-day Adventists, claim that they are the 144,000 who are worshiping faithfully on the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. And they believe that us who worship, or we who worship on the first day of the week on Sunday, that we are the mark of the beast. Okay, a little bit of strange teaching there. And also the 144,000 are not part of the New Testament church. Because these specifically are said to be Jews. And in fact, we'll find a little bit more about them in chapter 14. If you want to turn over to Revelation 14, there are a few more details. We know that uh, the Bible doesn't say that the 144,000 are witnesses. It calls them servants. But I think quite likely they will be like the apostles that Jesus called who went out to preach and to teach and to witness among Israel. So likely this 144,000 group is going to go out through the land, whether it's just Israel or throughout the world, to tell people about the judgment, about Jesus the Messiah. But most people are not going to listen. In Revelation 14, the first five verses give us some more detail about this same group of men. It says in verse 1, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So by comparing chapter 7 with chapter 14, we find out that these are 144,000 Jewish young men who are virgins, who are servants of God, who are sealed in their forehead with the name of God the Father, and they are sealed in chapter 7 near the beginning of the tribulation. 
and that's on the earth. And then by the time we get to chapter 14, John sees them in heaven with Jesus. So throughout the time that they spent on the earth, they were serving God, doing what God called them to do. But there come a point when their lives were lost, when they were more than likely martyred and executed for their testimony of the word of God. But that seal on their forehead was for their protection so that the devil couldn't hurt them, at least not until it was time for them to go on to glory. The Bible says they're without guile and fault as far as the Lord is concerned. And just like Jesus chose his disciples to go across the land to preach, so too, I think these 144,000 will be doing something similar. That doesn't mean that a lot of people are going to get saved under their work and service for the Lord. So during the time that God keeps them on the earth, they cannot be hurt with all the plagues, with all the judgments, with all the horrors and things that are going on. But they will die near the end of the first three and a half years of the tribulation, somewhere about the midway point. So in chapter 14, we don't see them on earth. We see that they are in heaven. And not only that, it talks there about in heaven that they're singing a new song. It's a song that no one else can learn. It's a special song that God gives to them. These are the first fruits of the redeemed of Israel. Their work on earth was finished. Surely they have helped lead some to the Lord Jesus to have faith in God. And it also tells us in chapter 14 that they follow the Lamb. Wherever he goes, they are with the Lamb. This is not the New Testament church. Because we are a Gentile bride. We're the Gentiles who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are with Jesus because I believe Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, when John hears the call from heaven come up hither, I believe that's a picture of the rapture of the church. That we are in heaven for chapters 4 and 5 and 6 and now 7, all the way through Revelation, and we're staying up there in heaven with the Lord Jesus until Revelation 19, partway through that chapter, when Jesus comes back to the earth with the armies of heaven and with us as well, and he'll come back with 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. So who are this 144,000? Well, the Bible just told us, comparing Scripture with Scripture, we can understand a lot about these 144,000. Wouldn't you also agree with me, though, that you and I should be like these 144,000? We're not the 144,000, but there are some wonderful characteristics. Should not we, as lovers of the Lord Jesus Christ, should not we be God's servants? Should we not be his witnesses? Should we not live a pure life like they did? Should we uh, not recognize that as believers we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? That's what Paul wrote, just as they were sealed in their forehead. In other words, shouldn't we be willing to let the rest of the world know that we are a Christian, that we belong to Jesus Christ? We should not be ashamed of him. The Bible says if we deny him before men, he's going to deny us before the Father. Let's make sure that our lives show that we belong to Christ. And also, like the 144,000, should we understand, too, that when our life's work is over, when we're done on this earth, that we will be taken home into glory. And there in heaven, you and I are going to sing a lot of songs, and we're going to be with the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, forever and ever. There are some really interesting things we can learn about this group of people. Just like God called John the Baptist to be a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. John's ministry was to tell people, repent and get ready because the Lord's coming. I think, too, these 144,000 are going to tell people, get ready, the Lord's coming. And you and I should be telling that, too. Because we have family and friends and co-workers and neighbors who are lost. And if we wait very much longer to tell them, it might be too late for them. We have to be witnesses as well. 
That's exactly what Jesus told the apostles before he ascended. And that's also what uh, Paul wrote, that uh, he didn't call us witnesses. Jesus said, you shall be witnesses. Paul, when he wrote, he said, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're here on this earth to do something. If we didn't have work to do on the earth, as soon as we got saved, God would have taken us on to heaven. He keeps us here on the earth for a time to do his work as his servants. Are you doing what God's called you to do? Are you going to hear him one day say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? I plan to hear that. I hope you do too. This morning I just want to say again, I love Jesus. Yes, I love my wife, but I love Jesus even more. Not that I don't love her enough, but the love that we have for the Lord Jesus is totally unlike any other type of love. And why do we love him? Because he first loved us, exactly. I am Jesus' friend. He's my friend. That's why I sang a little while ago, he is so precious to me. It's amazing how much he loved me. It's amazing how much he's forgiven me for of my sins and iniquities. And it's also amazing that he died in my place so that I could live in his place in heaven. The Bible teaches us so that God put our sin on the Lord Jesus Christ. He became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He paid my sin debt. It's paid in full by the blood of the cross. And so when God the Father sees me and you as redeemed children of God, he sees us through the blood of Jesus. He sees us as declared righteous. That should be the best news that we can give to anyone. People get excited about news. Have you heard the latest? Have you heard about this or that? This one's expecting a baby. Usually a baby causes a lot of rejoicing. Or this one's having a significant birthday. They, they've reached their 80th birthday. Or something significant like that. We, we like to share those types of things. Oh, someone, they won first prize at the, the county fair in the pie contest or whatever. You know, we like to share good news sometimes, and then we also share bad news sometimes. Did you hear what happened to so-and-so? So-and-so passed away yesterday. You know, and that causes some sorrow and heavy-heartedness. Well, the good news of the gospel is, yes, Jesus did die on the cross, but he rose again that third day, and he left the earth with the promise, I'm coming back. That's what we need to be witnesses about. Let's bow our heads as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message that you've given me about the 144,000. And Lord, it's not so much things that I've thought up or come up with. It's, it's just letting the scriptures speak plainly about these things. The scriptures make it clear. And Lord, in the passage that we've studied today, we see that there are those four angels who are controlling the winds. And we see then this other angel that ascending, uh, ascending from the east. And Lord Jesus, that likely might be you. I don't know for sure. I can't say I'm 100% accurate. But it seems like that because you have the authority, you have the command to choose and to seal that 144,000. Thank you, Lord, you also chose me. Thank you that you died for my sins, that I'm forgiven. And thank you that you're coming back one day to take me to my heavenly home. Lord, help us all to be witnesses for you. And Lord, help those who are listening to this message, maybe even at a later date, to understand that if they are not a born-again child of God, that what they must do is repent of their sin, admit that they're a sinner. They must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then they need to confess Him before men. They need to be a witness and tell others what great things God has done. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if, if you're still watching by way of the video, trust Jesus as your Savior. You're not guaranteed another minute of today, let alone tomorrow, next week, next month, next, next year. The Bible says now is the day of salvation. Please get saved today because Jesus is coming soon.